Greetings, friends. There's two parts to this video. First, I'll discuss the scientists who are skeptical of Darwinism. Second, I'll deconstruct the belief in natural determinism which drives many of the Darwinists. I respect people like Ryan Falk of the Alternative Hypothesis or Jean-Paul Guerrier-P because they're very intelligent, very scientific men. Ryan has often made the statement, evolution is true, as if it's an established fact, which of course it isn't. Jean-Paul, on the other hand, recently had a debate with some guy, uh, I, I guess the other guy was uh, critical of evolution, and Jean-Paul said something at the beginning of the debate like, uh, well, I believe in natural selection as the fundamental mechanism or something to that effect. I didn't actually watch the debate, so perhaps Jean-Paul now realizes it's more complicated. Um, but the, the idea is intelligent people like this will make these statements like evolution is true or natural selection explains everything. And the problem with making these statements is that it's too simplistic and it obscures the fact that there's a lot of disagreement over the issues. Ryan Falk and Jean-Paul Guerrier-P show us that even highly intelligent people can fall into this religious mindset. Not that there's anything wrong with being religious. Ryan claims to be an atheist. Now, am I overstating what it means to be in a religious mindset? Maybe. But the fact is, we all have principles. We all have fundamental axioms, which must be sacred and unquestioned to us. It is these fundamental principles on which we found our thinking. So despite all my disagreements with Jordan Peterson, this is one thing he is dead on about. Everyone must have some faith, and that includes these rationalists or materialists. Evolutionary theory, at least in its present form, has more holes in it than a maggot-infested piece of Swiss cheese. I've already discussed these deficiencies in previous videos. If you're interested, see the links in the description. However, some of the main problems will be addressed further on in this video. But my main purpose here is to let you know that even established scientists have criticized evolution, are skeptical of the mainstream theory. It's not just people on the fringes of society. There's an online petition of over 1,000 scientists from around the world. They've all endorsed the following statement. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Their website is called descentfromdarwin.org. I spent some time reading it. Quote, Signatories of the scientific descent from Darwinism must either hold a PhD in a scientific field such as biology, chemistry, mathematics, engineering, computer science, or one of the other natural sciences, or they must hold an MD and serve as a professor of medicine. End quote. It mentions that some of the scientists who've signed the petitions are members of institutions like Harvard, Stanford, MIT, Cambridge, and Oxford, and other famous institutions. Now, please excuse me, I want to do a bit of reading. I don't normally do too much reading during my videos, but this is important stuff, and it gives us a good overview of the issue and the problems of Darwinism. This is from descentfromdarwin.org. Quote, there are three common usages of the term evolution. Evolution number one, microevolution, small-scale changes in a population of organisms. Evolution number two, universal common descent, the idea that all organisms are related and are descended from a single common ancestor. Evolution number three, Darwinian evolution, the view that an unguided process of natural selection acting upon random mutation has been the primary mechanism driving the evolution of life. No one doubts evolution number one, which is sometimes called microevolution. Some scientists doubt evolution number two, but the scientific descent from Darwinism list only concerns evolution number three, also called Darwinian evolution or Darwinism. We defined evolution number one by equating it with microevolution, small-scale changes in a population of organisms. Collectively, evolution number two and number three might be termed macroevolution, which is defined as follows. 
Macroevolution, large-scale changes in populations of organisms, including the evolution of fundamentally new biological features. Typically, this term also means that all life forms descended from a single common ancestor through unguided natural processes. Unfortunately, evolutionists sometimes purposefully confuse these definitions, hoping you won't notice that they've overstated their case. They will take evidence for microevolution, or evolution number one, and then over-extrapolate the evidence and claim it supports macroevolution, you know, number two and number three. Indeed, sometimes evolution advocates will equate microevolution and macroevolution, the idea being that macroevolution is just repeated rounds of microevolution added up. End quote. And then it continues a bit further on in their website. They pose the good question. What scientific evidence challenges Darwinian evolution? Number one, genetics. Mutations cause harm and do not build complexity. You know, we've been taught again and again that, oh, it's these small mutations. Uh, that's producing new life. Well, no, I mean, no, that's that's a degeneration. Again, I don't mean to put the religious angle on this. I don't mean to, you know, I gotta, you know, this is all about science. And they, they, go, they continue, they say, Darwinian evolution relies on random mutations that are selected by a blind, unguided process of natural selection. This undirected process has no goals. Being random, it tends to harm organism and does not improve them or build complexity. As biologist Lynn Margulis, a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences until her death in 2011, said, New mutations do not create new species. They create offspring that are impaired. Similarly, the past presidents of the French Academy of Sciences, Pierre-Paul Grass, contended that, quote, mutations have a very limited constructive capacity because no matter how numerous they may be, mutations do not produce any kind of evolution, end quote. Number two for scientific evidence challenging Darwinism, this would be biochemistry. Unguided and random processes cannot produce cellular complexity. Our cells are like miniature factories using machine technology, but dwarfing the complexity and efficiency of anything produced by humans. Cells use miniature circuits, motors, feedback loops, encoded language, and even error-checking machinery to decode or repair our DNA. As Bruce Alberts, former president of the U.S. National Academy of Science, observed, quote, The entire cell can be viewed as a factory that contains an elaborate network of interlocking assembly lines, each of which is composed of a set of large protein machines, end quote. Darwinian evolution struggles to explain the origin of this type of integrated complexity. Biochemist Franklin Harold admits in a book published by Oxford University Press, quote, There are presently no detailed Darwinian accounts of the evolution of any biochemical or cellular system, only a variety of wishful speculations, end quote. Number three, paleontology, which I've liked to discuss the most because it's, you know, most relatable. We think of fossils. We think of real animals. And they say, the fossil record lacks intermediate fossils. The fossil record's overall pattern is one of abrupt explosions of new biological forms and generally lacks plausible candidates for transitional fossils, contradicting the pattern of gradual evolution predicted by Darwinian theory. And let me interject here. That's why the evolutionists wanted to make the Earth so insanely old. I do think the Earth is old, but they made it really, really old just to make sense for their theory because like well you know it, it's so random it just it must take a long 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 time that's the only way it can make sense for them continuing this non-darwinian pattern has been recognized by many paleontologists university of pittsburgh anthropologist jeffrey schwartz states quote we are still in the dark about the origin of most major groups of organisms they appear in the fossil record as Athena did from the head of Zeus, full-blown and raring to go, in contradiction to Darwin's depiction of evolution as resulting from the gradual accumulation of countlessly infinitesimally minute variations, end quote. Likewise, the great evolutionary biologist Ernst Meyer explained that, quote, new species usually appear in the fossil record suddenly, not connected with their ancestors by a series of intermediates, end quote. Similarly, a zoology textbook observes, quote, 
Many species remain virtually unchanged for millions of years, then suddenly disappear to be replaced by a quite different but related form. Moreover, most major groups of animals appear abruptly in the fossil record, fully formed and with no fossils yet discovered that form a transition from their parent group." End quote. Okay, so let me move on to part two of this video. I'm going to discuss the kind of thinking which is often behind Darwinism. As mentioned, these people tend to think that they're above religion. Stefan Molyneux is a good example. He used to criticize Christianity, but he stopped when he realized they were a valuable potential audience, and also because they tend to oppose socialism, though in Latin America that might not always uh, be true from what I know, and maybe, I don't know, in Africa, and where, you know, where the Catholic Church is, I mean, when the Catholic Church, it doesn't always end up the same way. Let me just put it that way. Um, but the point is that Molyneux is still an atheist. For the exposure of Molyneux's own sacred values, I give credit to Jay Dyer, link in the description, whose argument I'll be summarizing here. It's something I'm familiar with, you know, guys like Dinesh D'Souza can say the same thing, and but Jay Dyer is a real philosopher, he lays it out for us. And the thing with Molyneux is he's trumpeting empiricism and reason, as if philosophers haven't already addressed these questions 400 years ago. He believes reason is based on material sense data. In this respect, he's like the neuroscientist Sam Harris or the evolutionary psychologist Gad Saad. For these people, the mind is purely a product of physical processes. You have no real agency over it. Therefore, you have no free will or self-consciousness. It's just an illusion. Now, I know many of you would agree that this is an absurdity. It goes directly against our intuition. But for the sake of argument, let's say the materialists are right, and our mind is just a reaction process in a world which is a big, dead machine. Well, then there can be no reason. Why? Because using reason means thinking for yourself, going over your experience, and choosing the true from the false. Reason supposes the existence of a self with free will, or in other words, a soul. Molyneux likes Aristotle for his logic, but even Aristotle believed in a soul. So the natural determinism of people like Stefan Molyneux and Sam Harris is based on absurdity. These people are essentially saying that they're a bag of meat, yet they insist that they can reason. Besides being ridiculous, it's also self-defeating, because why should I listen to someone who claims they are a bag of meat? So then, if reason doesn't come from the natural world, where does it come from? Well, classical reason, or the logos, is based on a metaphysical reality. For example, 5 plus 5 equals 10. This equation is entirely abstract and separate from the material reality which empiricism champions. You can say five oranges and five oranges make ten oranges. Sure, but it's still a concept in your mind. It has no actual physical basis. Those oranges aren't exactly the same size. They have different numbers of atoms. Atoms are constantly in flux. The whole physical world is changing and unstable. There's no way to get an absolute view of it because you're part of the same material world which is constantly changing. But that's not the case with math or with concepts in general. We have an idea of a dog or a cat, but never will you find two dogs or two cats which are exactly the same, even if they're clones. Does that mean that there's no such thing as a cat or a dog? Of course not. So we see that reason cannot be based on empiricism and natural determinism. This isn't to deny that empiricism and natural determinism have their place in science, they do but do not mistake them for the ultimate source of truth. Hasta luego, amigos!